So today, we, it's day, it's day one, and we are going to focus on business, finance, and economics. And our first speaker today, is Dr. Robert Cavazos. Dr. Robert Cavazos just waved at us. <laughs> okay, he's the pro a professor of business analytics and director of cybersecurity and risk management programs at the University of Baltimore. And we're happy to ha have you here. Let's give a good hey, warm Dr. welcome. Right. Hey, Dr. Co uh, Dr. Cavazos, I'm going to stop sharing and you can share your screen. I shall do so. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Cavazos. As uh, Dr. Moore pointed out, I am a professor at the University of Baltimore, where I teach uh, data analytics, business statistics, and I also direct the uh, cybersecurity and risk management programs. Uh, uh, my background is I've worked a lot in the industry, uh, also been a previously an academic. I've taught up uh, close to Amy in New York at Columbia University, uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Florida International and uh, University of Texas at San Antonio, where I've always taught uh, statistics and economics. I've worked a great deal in industry, uh, in both government and private sector. Uh, you know, essentially, I worked on the first uh, you know customer relationship management algorithm for Bank of America way back way before we called it data analytics or business analytics. We called it statistics. Uh, also. Uh, you know, one of the first, I did the first uh, for defaulted foreclosure algorithm for the Veterans Administration home mortgage. Uh, and also I've done a lot of uh, things in between uh, for, in terms of risk and measurement for healthcare fraud. And uh, the last couple of years, uh, I've been working very much on online advertising fraud and written a book on big data and the law as well in terms of how to use data uh, in terms of legal proceedings and understanding that legal risks. Uh, a lot of my work on online fraud has been covered in the Wall Street Journal, the Times of London, CNN, uh, CNBC, and others. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and that's what's uh, taking a lot of my research time these days is uh, working on various implications of that, both in research and uh, litigation and policy matters uh, before the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Trade Commission. So if you do data analytics, it's very easy to find yourself to be very, very busy. All right. So again, in uh, many ways, uh, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, PowerPoint, less is more. So that will reflect, uh, you will see that. And my big point to make is that data analytics is not new. Uh, it's become widespread and it's actually very, very misunderstood. Uh, a lot of it is to understand that in the last five years, uh, we've created more data than had been created previously in the entire history of humankind. Uh, with uh, it becoming sexy and, uh, and, and interesting to so many people, there are some risks. Uh, in terms of that it's actually a lot of the data is actually misunderstood and misused. So it, it, is, it is not new and with uh, popularization comes some risk. So a lot of, again, my work comes from people abusing data uh, and misleading people uh, and that creates a lot of opportunities for fraud. Uh, you've all probably seen this classic little cartoon where back when I started in this business, if you will, we just had statistics. Uh, then we dress it up a little bit and uh, we call it uh, machine learning. Uh, and this is again, the, you know, basic uh, iterative uh, programming. It's, it's, you know, this the statistical methods. Now they're called machine learning and a lot of the uh, data analytics and non-parametric methods are now called uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, let's, let's not forget that it's basically, uh, it's essentially statistics. And it's not going to be the classic hypothesis test. It's going to be a lot based on uh, non-parametric methods, uh, also uh, data and data classification methods, uh, data mining, and so forth. So, with uh, as I mentioned, when something becomes wildly popular, uh, you know, all of a sudden the terms, uh, you know, and a lot of it becomes marketing buzz. So it gets a it gets a little fuzzy uh, in terms of what means what. But again, if you've been seeing the progression of it, you see that it's uh, the things that we used to call non-parametrics 
uh, you know, or data mining or classification or algorithms are, are now called machine learning. Uh, and a lot of it is called uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, beware labels, uh, that's uh, the, the only thing. Uh, so we'll, and we'll delve on that more. Now, you know, I think a lot of people, and, I, and I'm very excited about this conference because everybody says, oh, and I get approached by the state of Maryland and other places at university. Oh, we gotta get people in careers in data analytics or business analytics. Well, I, I would go ahead and say, if you, and thankfully Amy set it up nicely by saying careers in business, economics, finance. Uh, and the point is that now if you want to have a meaningful career in business in any way, going from 2020 when moving on forward, it's going to entail some aspect of business analytics. Uh, to you know, So for example, on the CPA exam, uh, there's been now for the last uh, two cycles, there's now a whole section on data analytics. There's no, there's no getting away from it. If you're an accountant, uh, if you want to be a CPA, bookkeepings are going to be enough. You're going to have to, believe it or not, understand how to get uh, query data on, uh, you know, uh, with Python or SQL, and then understand how to do a, a, bit, a bit of, if you will, discriminate analysis or other data mining tools to identify potential fraud or issues in an audit, et cetera. So, uh, you know, so you may not be going to data analytics, but data analytics is certainly coming to you. Uh, in marketing, uh, all that marketing in many ways, you have these, uh, it, what used to be very simple, what you probably, many of you know, is analysis of variance, uh, you know, are now becoming and morphing into these big uh, A-B testing, which is a large uh, business experiments with multiple samples. Uh, do we make more sales if we put the coffee in the top eye of the top shelf or the middle shelf? Should we play music in our stores, not play music in our stores? Should we change the lighting? Uh, it is this panoply of ex uh, business experiments uh, to create a different uh, shopping environment for consumers because again, uh, it was, you know, with marketing of the intersection with psychology and you want to create a different uh, buzz or mood for your customers and see how that affects uh, sales, for example. Finance is pretty obvious. I mean, it's going to be, you know, anything from credit reporting to profiling, uh, you know, potential if you're selling insurance uh, and so forth. Risk management, uh, that's actually very large now, especially now with uh, the intersection of cybersecurity uh, and infrastructure, uh, web safety and so forth. Uh, there's, uh, there's a huge space in risk management. Uh, and uh, I would call it, uh, the, rather than just narrow down the risk management, I call it enterprise-wide risk management because that includes uh, your online system, uh, employee theft, uh, misbehavior, uh, acts of God, and all these things that have to be quantified with elaborate uh, algorithms and constantly be retuned. Uh, law enforcement executives, you know, uh, uh, you know, assessing the probability of where to, you know, even harvest tickets, uh, where you know the crime hotspots are, and so forth, and, and that's huge. Uh, public sector. One of the best examples, I think, of public sector using big data, and it's very revolutionary, and a lot of uh, public sector organizations have been resistant, but, you know, it's gaining ground. And, and also public administration, a field that I've been involved with, also there's a huge uh, realm uh, uh, for uh, data analytics, whether it's for determining child custody, uh, whether someone gets employed or not. And then lately, again, the more revolutionary, you could look it up a Google uh, subsidiary uh, called Premise Data. Uh, what they do, they empower citizens and the city of Waco, Texas is an example, rather than waiting for supervisors from public works to see how things are doing, uh, you get micro payments, you pay people, you know, 10 cents, a dollar for taking pictures of incidents, whether it's potholes, trash, and then this is uploaded and then you could go ahead and a data and a, with using the you know the real time data uploaded by citizens, uh, you could dispatch trucks. You could do this, and then also you start creating a time series where you observe patterns of issues and uh, engagement and so forth. So this goes at infinitum. I mean, the applications for analytics are incredible. Uh, in my online fraud work, I will you know analyze billions of ad impressions to find out which ones are human and which ones are bots, for example. And this actually could save and does save advertisers millions of dollars. So there's 
all sorts of really interesting applications. So <clears throat> now, and, and Amy touched upon this, uh, not everyone needs to be a complete data analytics uh, expert or specialist. Uh, what you want to do if you want to understand whether you want to advance in a complex organization or you want to be an entrepreneur or you're just a citizen or investor that wants to understand things, then you know you need to know sufficient about the applications and use and ideas of analytics and also so you can communicate so that you could get understand what your data needs are, what to look for and what to do. Uh, and that, that's why I find that it's key to distinguish between the how, uh, the what, and the why uh, for an analytics career, okay? So, you know, briefly about the how. <clears throat> There's a lot of work and it pays a lot of money, uh, you know, between really doing analytics, being a data scientist. Uh, and, you know, and these are, again, uh, just as somebody said me, a, a, a couple of roles uh, doing, doing business analytics. And some of these roles, uh, you know, the Metro DC area, for example, paid anywhere from 200 to $400,000 a year. Uh, and so to really, but to really, uh, you know, be eligible for this, to really do it, you have to really know statistics in a deep fashion. And this ultimately includes a solid footing in mathematics, and coding. And there's no shortcuts to that because these are the people who are inventing algorithms, who are getting into the intricacies of data that involves billions of records. Uh, you know, you also have to be able to, in terms of hang with uh, several programming language, mostly you do SQL, Python, Ruby on Rails, SAS, uh, Stata. You need to be able to create your own uh, algorithms in R or other uh, IBM based software, uh, but you need to be able to get down into the, the foundational, if you will, almost the molecular level of this work. Uh, and, and again, it, it's not impossible, uh, but it is challenging. So what are these things? So, and, but not everybody has to do this, right? And so it's uh, the reason, again, the, you know, basic economics, the reason the pay for this is so high is that the, the barriers to entry are reasonably high. Uh, and the what? And this is uh, what I teach uh, in, uh, in business schools. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, basically what you do is you teach the core ideas and the applications. So nobody's going to be deriving equations on pieces of paper. Uh, in most cases, you'll be working with R, you'll be working with Excel, and then you'll get some of the, the versions of statistical techniques and algorithms. And, and this is the type of, of knowledge that you could work in terms of in a, in a very capable fashion in any number of organizations, whether it's marketing, uh, whether it's insurance, uh, banking, entrepreneurship, marketing increasingly, uh, government, uh, homeland security work, uh, you know, all of this. So this is a type of analytics that's, again, what I would call sort of the uh, applied analytics. And this is uh, where there's, uh, there is a lot of demand for this. There is a huge demand. And this is in many ways the sweet spot that's accessible, but you know, it's, it, quite frankly, even applied statistical techniques and so forth require a fair amount of effort and knowledge. But again, you don't have to essentially, as you, if you were being a, 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 you know, a pure data scientist, you don't have to be essentially an applied mathematician. This is, Again, where I see a lot of demand for work across many sectors, uh, certainly for my students that do this, uh, end up doing fairly well for themselves. So this is the what. And then the why, again, as I mentioned before, uh, more data has been created in the last five years than in all of human history. Uh, so, you know, our contemporary context is drowning in data. Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, about the economy, business, and life, you know, not, it, it, it comes from not understanding data. And that leads to poor decisions. Uh, and there's a lot of reading. One of my favorites is uh, John Paulo's uh, book, is at uh, Temple many years ago. Uh, you know, basically, his book was called The Mathematician uh, Reads the Newspaper, where, you know, you could go through any journalistic account, even today. I make it a point. I don't, you know, I go through it, you know, with the exception of the Wall Street Journal sometimes misses it, but a lot of even the Post and other uh, major newspapers, if you go through when they're discussing economic or financial or employment data, they always get it wrong. They do not understand math. 
Uh, in this case, it reminds me of Herbert Stein. You know, if you want to start doing data analytics, you have to understand uh, the Herb Stein uh, dictum that the difference between a 5% unemployment rate and a 10% unemployment rate isn't as 99% uh, of members of Congress would say, oh, well, that's only 5%. No, the difference between a 5% unemployment rate and a 10% unemployment rate is 100%, right? And so, so to be an effective data analyst, you start to have to start digging a little bit critically and not responsive. You have to start uh, using your brain. And then for question and answer, I, I hope someone tells me how they calculated and know that the difference between 5% and 10% is not five points. It is actually 100%. And, you know, sometimes in order to be there in terms of the why to think analytically, because we are drowning in data and many of us make decisions based on data, is to understand the core. So uh, I would uh, hasten to add that if you are really wanting to uh, think of a career in data, once you start, you have to start to think about it. it's not just a job, it's also a mindset. You really have to start thinking about the core ideas. It's just think about uh, my brother is on this. He's uh, in addition to being a statistician and professor, he's also a musician and he'll agree. And it's true in statistics and data analytics as well. Uh, the best musicians will practice chords over and over and over again, even though they're virtuosos. Similarly, if you expect to be successful in a career in data analytics, you have to start really thinking about the basics a lot and that will inform. So think about percentage changes, uh, rates of change, start looking at how is data collected? Uh, you know, is, it quanti is it qualitative? Are they transforming the data right? Are they scaling it properly? Uh, what's the level of aggregation? So before you launch off into, oh, I'm gonna be a career in data analytics, you have to think about, if you will, the, the stuff that you learn in sort of the, your first semester business statistics course that involves means, probability distributions, that has to be in your brain, just like imprinted uh, in order for you to be truly successful. And then you have to go back to it over and over and over again. I teach uh, intro statistics uh, from time to time. I, I reread I re different intro stats books every year, all the time. I go back to the foundations and then obviously I will go to the more complex things, but. You always have to revisit the basics. And if you're not grounded in the basics, uh, the first thing you do is you have to be facile and it has to be like knowing the alphabet. Uh, you have to really have all of that down. Now, uh, where do I see opportunities? Well, I see them everywhere. Uh, you know, and obviously that's the cliche of uh, success, uh, preparation and luck. Uh, and again, Amy alluded to this. One of the things that you have to understand is, can you still, can you tell stories with data? One of the things I tell students, for example, we do an intermediate statistics course using Microsoft Excel. Uh, and after a while, everybody gets all excited because they can run, you know, descriptive statistics, they could run a difference of means test or regression even. Uh, but then they realize that after a while, you could train a very bright dog or chimpanzee to do this, or you could, it could be done almost automatically. So if you were able to run a regression on Excel or R, yay, whip, yay, that's great. Okay, now go explain it to someone who is a manager, a decision maker, who doesn't know what the heck uh, an F value is or what a coefficient, uh, what's the P score? What does that mean? What's the R adjusted R square? Why is that important? Oh, why do you need to rerun the regression? What does it mean? What is it predicting? Uh, so you have to be tell a, a, the story in an engaging way, honestly, also. Uh, and so where do you keep current? Well, I think one of the ways to keep her is obviously read a lot of the, either general interest or technical statistics in data analytics books. Also, as you're advancing, for those of you who are more advanced, obviously, you know, if you have some algorithms or work you've done or a, a really interesting code, uh, you know, have it on GitHub uh, so you can show them, uh, you know, and, you know, you have to certainly you know, avoid some things. Uh, I think some people get over uh, zealous. I've seen people normalizing zip code data, for example. I've seen, 
uh, prominent researchers presenting in major conferences or even consultants to clients who again make the rate of change difference. Uh, they don't understand that. Or, you know, all of a sudden they include a coefficient as an explanatory variable in a, in a major thing uh, that doesn't, uh, uh, that is not accurate. One of my favorites was as a consultant to uh, some voting, to a voting issue. And some individual uh, looked at uh, what uh, the census does. And they do basically a five year survey of population change, it's five years. And this is supposedly uh, expert in statistics. So instead of saying, well, this is the average on year five, because it's a weighted mean that goes down year by year. He thought since it was a five year uh, you know, series that he would take the middle year and say, well, this is the midpoint. This is uh, what the, the real uh, population is. I of course was on the other side and uh, I made short work of his mistake. Uh, and you know, this person had been billing $500 an hour as an expert. Uh, so he made uh, that mistake, uh, you know, and, and again, what, what, what to really, really do? Again, I have to reemphasize this. Yeah, and yeah, you know, a lot of people in uh, you know in the job world. I work in, at the University of Baltimore. I work try do my job is to educate and get people from disadvantaged opportunities in Baltimore City to be employable. And so what I have to do is, and it's hard at times, but I have to make people understand that, you know, to quote Scott Adams, uh, you know, it is sounds strong, but goals are for losers. Don't say, oh, I want to work in finance. No, the real thing, what I really suggest all my students do, and this is what the, in fact, the ones that do this tend to be fairly successful, is to build a system for their own professional success. And this goes back to what I say earlier, uh, know the basics of analytics and know them well, then develop your skill set for the more advanced techniques, be able to tie it into one or two or three of the business disciplines, know enough about how to apply analytics in marketing or in finance, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, marketing finance or even in management. One of the areas that people don't think about where there's great opportunities is actually in HR. HR is, is, is now really very analytics driven. And anyone who wants to, you know, strong analytics and uh, does, understands data mining and queries can really make themselves, have themselves a, a great deal of success in HR, which actually is fairly interesting uh, as I've come to realize over the years and the applications there are incredible. Rarely do I see a, a somebody coming into the university and saying, oh, I want to be an analyst for HR. That doesn't happen. Uh, all, but all of a sudden, sometimes they say, hey, look, that's where the jobs are. Okay. And sure enough. So, you know, what I'm saying is wedge yourself to your skills and then having a broad view of where you can apply these skills. Because the opportunities for anyone that's capable in business analytics are infinite. So, it would be, uh, I think, I, you know, uh, dishonest or misleading rather for me to say, oh, really look at finance. Well, there's the obvious things. It's the not so obvious things where there are also a lot of opportunities because everyone pursues the obvious things. So, you know, be, be fairly broad minded in where you can apply this, which is why I always suggest people to make it part of your life. So, so I've had students uh, classify their, their grocery shopping track their fitness, the amount of time they spend on social media, so they could start to develop a sense of how to apply analytics uh, throughout uh, you know, their lives, all right? So I will be happy to take uh, any questions if anybody's willing to raise their hand, if, and if I could see you. David Cavazos, you have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know this guy. Yeah, vaguely, right? Yeah. Um, so, and this goes back to what Amy was talking about as well, but in your presentation, you, you described kind of two really big trends, right? That data is everywhere yeah, and there's a great need to use it, but there's a relatively poor understanding of how to use it and how, exactly. to, use it, how to use it properly. 
So what do you think are some of the broader social implications of this gap between the need to use it and the lack of understanding of how to use it? Yeah, I think you see it, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, again, not say you see that in a lot of bad decisions in large organizations, or I would say limited decisions in that bad and value judgment. They just don't have the data or the capacity. I see it, at, you know, in Baltimore a lot, in municipal government, for example, or you know, bad policing decisions. And uh, education uh, is one where the data analytics is not properly used, and that's that's. I think that's a significant issue. Uh, you know, Amazon is, everybody deals with Amazon. That's a great, you know, that's an example of how data is used really well. I mean, you know, or the the, the famous Target litigation where they were, were, and I'm sure you've probably heard it, they were too good at the data analytics. So uh, there's the classic case, a young lady living with her parents and all of a sudden she starts getting all these coupons for diapers and Babies R Us and discounts for baby formula. Uh, and it turned, you know, and you know, she didn't know it, but she was actually pregnant. Target knew she was pregnant before she did, based on her consumption patterns. So their analytic uh, analytics algorithms were so good uh, that they actually noticed the change in her consume, consumption behavior and knew, oh, she's pregnant. Let's send her some stuff. Obviously, they, you know, that was go, taking it too far. Uh, for you know privacy reasons and uh, just a little intrusive, but that's an example of, of how to use it. But yeah, it is, and there's also the issue that a lot of firms are popping up that are uh, less than honest in terms of how they use data and analysis, and they can be very misleading. And sometimes it's just simple things by using a, a regular mean instead of a geometric mean, for example, for selling investments. And so yeah, so. The, 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 and as you know, in my world of the advertising fraud, it's also data is used to mislead marketers and say, look, we got millions of people buying this stuff. Here's our numbers and nobody drills down. So yeah, there's great opportunities for good and there's great opportunities for bad. So there's the, the fraudsters love big data, let me tell you. It, it opens up a lot of, and it can be very confusing for people, so. That's an excellent question. You must have learned this from an older sibling or something. Yeah, and the, his research. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Um, I see we have another question um, from Raisha and it is asking, what is a project that you are currently working on? If anyone else has other questions, you can feel free to write it in the chat as well or raise your hand, but what is a project you're currently working on? Oh, uh, one of the, the projects I'm working on right now is on click fraud. So everybody clicks on ads, and I'm sure many of you do, whether you want to admit it or not. And so basically, click fraud is uh, advertising agencies uh, sell to uh, companies and say, hey, look, we can deliver up these, uh, these clicks and you know, pay us $100 for 1,000 clicks. And they're like, yeah, yeah, clicks. They'll, they'll, they'll look at our ad. This is awesome. Uh, it turns out that, you know, that about half of those are bots. They're not real clicks. And so I, I have found a way now to distinguish the behavior of how humans behave versus bots. And so now there is uh, identifying ways. So that's, that's my latest project. It sounds simple and in concept it is, but getting the data using billions of observations, eh, it's a little bit time consuming, but ultimately when you get the results, it's like, oh, happy day. That's a really cool project. I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how long have you been working on it so far? On that project, it took me about three months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And before that, I did. I've done fake influencers, like social influencers. Mm -hmm. You could tell whether someone, and it, it took some doing. You could tell whether someone who, if you're like, for example, on Twitter or whatever and you're like uh, an influencer and you go to an advertising agency and you say, hey, look, I've got a million people. I could, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, give yeah. some money for some sponsored tweets. I got a million people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're like, yeah, he's got a million people. And uh, let's pay him a bunch of money because he's got a million. But it turns out that, you know, about 800,000 of his followers are bots. So there's also mm -hmm. ways using data analytics where you could tell like what a real person does and what a bot does. Oh, I got to tell you, the bots are getting better and better because guess what? The people who program the bots use artificial intelligence to simulate human behavior. So now it's getting mm. a little hairy, I got to tell you. 
So, wow. which is my point that the yeah, data analysis could be used for good and it could be used for evil. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yeah. Who's this? Ryan? Yeah. My name is Ryan. Uh, you seem familiar. <laughs> everybody's been saying that. Yeah. You got uh, one of those faces. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, I, in your presentation, you talked about dealing with the census at one point, if I recall correctly. Yes. Uh, when it comes to that, how do you, do you think they do a decent enough job when it comes to using like data analytics to actually analyze? No? <clears throat> uh, well, yes and no. I, I worked uh, a few years ago uh, on a project for the data uh, for, you know, the Census Bureau on improving their housing and retail statistics. Mm -hmm. All right. And this was 2017, 2016. All right. What, for example, if you looked at, for example, they had a category of getting retail data from hardware, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, 80% of the hardware market is by two companies, right? right you know. And so how did they collect the data? They sent a fax. Yeah, that's, that's... kind of sad. Yeah. Uh, and then what happens if it, one, one of the persons who was in charge of one of the faxes, you know, she would go on vacation and, uh, you know, take days off or the fax would fall behind the thing. And so all of a sudden they would have to say, well, we have to do a, a readjustment. So they were waiting desperately for the other person to send their fax and begging them to do so. Uh, and so the, the hardware sector data was a mess, right? And this was recently. And so they used to also do automobile uh, parts, uh, but they got away from that. So now they started buying it from uh, the market from other providers. So the, the census is making some progress in that they're buying, uh, you know, actual observed data. Uh, the gold standard would be uh, whether it's observational or premise or actually having swipe data by category, but that, you know, they're not quite ready to go there, but they have made incrementally, but so much of their data is based on surveys, uh, not not like uh, a, a real close survey, but they send th something in the mail. And for the typical small business person getting a stack of mail like this, mm -hmm. you know, the, the last thing you want to do is fill out a census. I mean, I, I don't want like filling out my census forms. Do you? It's like, yeah, I got other things to do. And so, yeah, so they've had historically, I mean, they are the gold standard in many ways, but they also have a, a lot of holes you could drive a truck through in terms of the data. So yeah, th there is a lot of issues with it. It's not, I have to tell you, I think the Eurostat people do a much better job, Not maybe not even in collecting it, uh, data, but actually uh, presenting it and organizing it. Uh, if you go to the census website, it's a nightmare. You can't find anything. You really have to spend hours. So. Yeah. It, there's a lot of fundamental problems with the census uh, these days, and that's unfortunate. It is. Uh, I wonder if there's any opportunities to help out with that. <laughs> yeah, no, they're always they're always hiring. They're always hiring. Uh, and there's some. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to be dismissive. Uh, they, some of the uh, some of their units do extraordinary world class work. And so, yeah, no, there. It's uh, it's like every organization. It depends where you go, right? But uh, they do great work, and uh, they're they're always hiring capable people. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we have a question from um, Victoria Dabla is asking, am I able to teach myself data analytics tools such as SAS and Python to expand my skill set? And then is a major in finance and a minor in statistics data analytics a step in the right direction? Uh, I mean, in terms of finance and statistics, uh, yes, I mean, that, that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, cannot stick. To, and again, uh, with a finance major, you also have to pick and choose what your courses are. If you could take a business analytics class that involves, for example, modeling, uh, you know, also Monte Carlo simulation, uh, those type of things are highly applicable in finance. So uh, de uh, mo developing models, uh, model validation and then uh, Monte Carlo simulation would be the, uh, the way to go. And also learning how to apply a lot of whether it's simple, you know, which could be accomplished, all the Excel functions or so forth. In terms of teaching yourself Python and so forth, I, you know, I don't know you, so it's hard to say. Uh, some people could teach themselves well, others could not. 
But the, the reality of it is you will need uh, some sort of certification. And so what we're seeing now, for example, even with our undergrad, our better undergraduates or MBAs, just for market test, we have, uh, you know, we suggest they get, for example, the Microsoft certification in Excel, which is, uh, you know, the basic and then the expert. Uh, by the same token, for some students, we also strongly recommend, again, this is as a market signal because you do need some sort of a certification, uh, is, uh, you know, any of the courses in data mining or Python available on uh, the former MOOCs, which are now short course providers such as Coursera or edX uh, that have courses which, you, uh, which are very well developed, by the way, uh, it could do that uh, in terms of, you know, certifying that you have certain skills. And so I would suggest if you, that would be the efficient way to teach yourself, learn it, and at the same time, have some validation. Also be very good at coding, get a GitHub, because again, as you know, many of you know, uh, essentially uh, Google has uh, no, no longer requires a college degree just to test. There's also a lot of disruption in higher education. I mentioned Google. Google now is offering a six month course, uh, you know, uh, that uh, ultimately Python and so forth uh, that has, again, you know, a very strong brand certification and they report that the starting uh, salaries for the graduates of that six month certification program is on the order of $70,000 a year, uh, which is actually scary for a lot of people in, uh, in the four year colleges because if you do calculate the ROI on huh, four year college degree, 150,000 in debt, six month Google certification, $20,000, but hey, they pay, they take it out only if I get a job uh, and no interest. So uh, your finance major, calculate the ROI on that. So Google could be a way also, but that's again, that's an exclusive, like a six month uh, boot camp. So there, there's a lot of good providers like the Lambda School or Flatiron School uh, that will give you a solid data analytics uh, techniques, uh, certification and training uh, that are fairly extensive and well recognized in the marketplace. I hope that answers your question. Okay, we have another one. Uh, using, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Using Zhang, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. it is. Okay, you could ask your question. Yes. What is your? Mm -hmm. Hi, professor. I'm currently a sophomore, and I'm major in statistics. And I was thinking about like whether to major up to minor in economics or computer science would better aid in my data analytics skills. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I would have to say, you know, I'm an economist through and through statistician, right? I would say computer science, and that's not just me. Uh, Hal Varian, at, uh, who's a, a, a very famous professor at UC Berkeley, uh, one of the giants in economics, he's now the, the, he became the head, uh, head scientist or head uh, economist at Google. He tells all economics PhD students at the top schools, uh, you, know, you know what, you probably should consider doing more courses in computer science and statistics and less in economics. And so if it were between today if it were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I'd say economics today, computer science, without a doubt. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we have another question. Um, yes. The question is, is the, is the financial risk management program in graduate school part of the business statistics? No, it depends on the programs. I mean, you do have to take some business statistics. I mean, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, financial risk management, I, I dabble in it, I, I direct a program, a small program, we had a graduate program. There's so many ways to do it uh, in terms of how they do it. Some of it is more story management organization, how to build your organizations. So it's less quantitative, less quantitative, more qualitative, and some are more quantitative. So it, it depends where you are and what the emphasis are. So that one's, a, I would characterize it as a bit of a gray area. Some of the people in risk management do great work. I mean, uh, it's basically actuarial science. Many of them do actuarial science, which is the life tables, life models, uh, risk and hazard and so forth. So that gets to be very intensive mathematically and statistically, which is kind of cool stuff. And then others are more, you know, uh, engaging the organization. So 
I, I would have to know the program. I don't know. Okay. Are there any other questions? Give me questions. Feel free to come on your mic as well in case you don't want to type. Yes. Um, question. Yes, Raisha. Raisha, correct? Hi. Doing. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I first of all want to thank you for this very informational, um, you know, talk and presentation. But uh, my question was, if you, you know, if you could give your younger self some advice about this, um, you know, about data analytics and about some career advice, what would you give? Someone who myself, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, gosh, uh, 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 that, that is actually that's, uh, that's an awesome question. I, I think you know it's it, it is now because it is again very very powerful and useful, but it's also ubiquitous. So the competition is stiff. I mean, there's opportunities, but uh, you know, uh, the com I again I would say get as capable as you can with all the tools get visibility by going on GitHub uh, and, and going out there and develop uh, your own portfolio of work uh, in, in that. Also, uh, you know, also try to build like a, a narrative report and then, you know, even get, get it out there a little bit in case, because, you know, employers, they Google people. You know, if you're on LinkedIn, you know, write a post, hey, look, I did this data analysis and look, this is what it looks like or get a, a medium account and, you know, write a, you know, two page or some nice literary treatment on your experience how data analytics changed the way you viewed the world, uh, what you've learned, how you saw things differently. I mean, and, and these are all, again, things that I think will be useful just in your personal growth. So I think my advice to myself is stay out there, uh, constantly be building up your skills, constantly. Uh, and just get better at it and more efficient at it. I, I mean, I've been doing this for, you know, probably longer than many here have been alive and I still uh, you know, learn and I'm surprised by things and I want to get new, learn new techniques. And uh, so, yeah, I would say get out there and, and keep on building your skills. It, it, it ain't easy, you know, but you know, after a while you, it gets interesting and you just do it uh, by default. It becomes part of who you are. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it did. thank you so much. Dr. Cavazos, you have a question? Yeah, I got a question. And this, I think this will be helpful for a lot of our students yeah. that are out there listening right now, because you do have a lot of experience, not only with various methods, but also various platforms, right? SQL, That's right. R, SAS, Data, SPSS. So in your mind, if you were, what advice would you give students today about how they should prioritize their learning of all of these tools, right? Because there's so many different tools available now to people and you kind of have to prioritize what should I learn first? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I think just to start, you know, because unfortunately, for example, a lot of community colleges still, we get transfers, they actually do basic stats by hand, you know, calculator and paper. And I just want to <laughs> track down and stalk whoever taught them that. Uh, I, I, you know, just get a map of Excel, believe it or not. It really is it's the first platform to get to use statistics. It's very, it's become very powerful. I would start with Excel and you become very proficient at Excel. And then in terms of uh, other, you know, so that would be the first platform. And then the languages, I would have to, you know, just to learn Python could be challenging, but for some students, maybe it could be a start first uh, with uh, something like Java, just so that you start getting in your brain the idea of, and then you get mastery and confidence and you could do others. So my suggestion would be uh, Excel uh, and then get some Java if you can, and definitely SQL or some other query language. And that's because that's pretty ubiquitous. And from those, you could launch off into other things. So I just say, again, it's just like uh, like you, David, in music, as you know, in addition to statistics, you go into the, the real basics and you master the basics. And then it's so much easier to leverage onto more complex tools. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Do you, do you think that they will ever monetize our software? I hope not. 
Uh, I mean, it, it, it is, it, 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 I, I, again, I really hope that because it's such a, a great tool. Uh, there is or was a great book. I'll show it to you. And this is something to really do. So it's uh, working in public. Oh, yeah. oh could you, uh, what, is, what is the title again? Yeah, it's called Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. And, ah, okay. and so, you know, it's funny, funny you asked that question because I was just uh, reading that uh, this morning. And it's, it's the view that, you know, open source software, it, it, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of the software, the, the algorithms that drive anything from Facebook to Uber was all open source. They just grabbed open source and put it together. And so, uh, and R is an example of that. So there's a lot of scripts out there, uh, you know, Ruby Rails, uh, Java, uh, that people have monetized, you know, they use open source and then they develop the IP around the specific way they develop the open source and go and make a bunch of money. Uh, and it's sad when you or strange when you think about it, for example, one of the people that uh, I forget that I think it was uh, one of the JavaScript codes, it was used for thousands of applications. There was one person who was getting uh, living on uh, donations of $20,000 a year, one person was running the whole open source and keeping it alive. Wow. Wow. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have a question. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, what is the bare minimum expected by employers for internships? Or does it vary? Because I don't have a whole lot of experience in um, data analysis. Yeah, it, it depends, and you know, it, it depends on the employer, and it depends on your definition of bare minimum. Okay. Uh, you know, what is your definition of uh, bare minimum, Victoria? Well, I guess learning uh, Java, SQL, as you mentioned, and Excel. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. If you know those, you should be able to get an intern. Depends where you are. Uh, depends, uh, you know, on the employer. So. Uh, in the DC area, you know, despite the, the, the pandemic, there's still some, uh, some, uh, we've had some success with internships and I, you know, and I just was asked for some uh, insurance industry interns that know basic programming or just are willing to learn. So there's, an, you know, so there's that, for example. I don't know where you are. I know that things are a little tighter in the New York, New Jersey metro area than they are in Baltimore, DC. Uh, but. So to answer your question, it's going to be a, it depends. OK, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Well, this was a great talk. I'm sure that you will get a chance to speak to. Uh, Dr. Cavazos, will you be at the social networking segments at all? Yeah, is that uh, towards, uh, you know, that's tomorrow and, uh, and Thursday, correct? Yes. yes. Well, I'll there's something to, uh, today if you're available, uh, yeah, today, you can stop by. Yeah. Today, yeah. There's networking each day of the conference. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I will pop in. Uh, I will probably pop in tomorrow because today's a little bit nutty. Uh, but, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. But I will. You will definitely uh, be stuck with me tomorrow. Oh, I'll that's great. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Um, we have um, a few minutes before the next talk. Uh, Lily, would you say 10 minutes break? Yeah, we're going to take a 10 minute break. The next talk is scheduled to start at 12.15. So sorry, I'll turn my camera on. The next talk, the, the next talk is scheduled to start at 12.15. So you kind of want to stay a little bit on schedule. So we're going to take a little break, 10 minute break. And um, feel free to get any water or food or anything. Then we'll just uh, we can be in right here. We'll still be on the call, of course, but we'll just be taking a little break and we'll see you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy, for your Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Yes. I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.